I want to speak to you today about <coughs> fire walkers. Let me tell you a story about this lady, her name is Mary Reesa. On the 2nd of July, 1951, the remains of Mary Reesa was found in an apartment in St. Petersburg, Florida. And what a strange sight it was. All that remained of her was a pile of ashes and a shrunken skull. The authorities and police that came in, they looked around and they looked at all the evidence and they were amazed to find out that the only thing that was actually burned was Mary Reesa and the chair that she was in. The rest of the apartment was untouched, unscathed. It was so bad that they actually called in the FBI. The FBI came in to investigate this case. They eventually said, okay, well, it must be a cigarette. She was smoking, and the cigarette fell off her clothes and then consumed her body. But that doesn't explain why she would be turned to ashes. In modern-day cremations, it takes a temperature of 2,500 degrees to cremate a body. And that's not even fully. That's a lot of bone fragments left. In her case, completely turned to dust. And then the second question was even more baffling. If the fire was so severe that you consume a whole body and turn it to dust, why did it not then burn anything else? There was even a pile of newspapers next to her on the cabinet, untouched, unscathed. The damage you see around the area is actually not due to fire, but due to heat. The baffling case, the authorities still have no idea of what happened. But there's some others that believe it is caused by something called spontaneous human combustion. Anybody heard of it? Nobody good. It's your first time. <laughs> Spontaneous <laughs> human combustion. This is a phenomenon that occurs when the body burns to such a degree that it turns to ashes. And the ignition of the fire is within the body. As in with Mary Reese's case, the FBI look for external sources. They look for plugs. They even considered lightning. They look all external sources to find out what could have caused it. They can find nothing plausible. But spontaneous human combustion says that the body is burned because of a fire triggered from the inside. And although medical science disregards this, you can see Sharp looking at me, yeah, right, this is a true phenomenon. <laughs> medical science does not regard this as a condition. Yet they, it still does happen. Mary Reese's case is one of a hundred well documented cases. As you can see, pictures around. The only things remain sometimes is the limbs. He can cut off the angles. Everything else is consumed to ashes. Unbelievable, eh? Spontaneous human combustion. The opposite of this would then be the people that seem to be immune to fire, like the fire walkers. I'm sure you've heard of fire walkers before. Fire walking is an act when you walk barefoot across hot, hot coals. Anybody done that before? Nobody. Come on, you're some new thing. Yeah. You're not that adventurous. No bunky jumping, no fire walking fire the sky. It's actually a very, very ancient practice. It was practiced 2,000 years before Christ in India. And even today, there's an annual festival where Indians get together. It's a festival of Timitri. Where they get together, they get a whole lot of coals together. And what do they do? They walk over it. And there we can see a very brave soldier walking across. I don't think he's walking. It looks like he's taking a brisk walk or a run across. Doesn't look like he's like, you can't get out of this place. <laughs> Wasting no time. But this is what they do every year. And science comes forward and says, well, you know, it's not actually religious. Because some people believe that you walk on coals because you place your faith in God, you show that you have more faith. Others say that it's a rite of passage. Others say it's just for religious reasons. But science says anybody, even you and I, you today, dares, you can walk across coals. You know why? They say that it's not actually about that, it's actually scientific. They call it the law of thermal conductivity. And that means that it's a transfer of heat from one object to another. As in this case, the hot coals to your bare feet. They say that coals predominantly is made up of carbon. And carbon is not a, con uh, not a good conductor of heat. It's not a very good one. And made with all that ash on top of it actually forms a protective layer. So even you might can walk across that. The scientists do say that it mustn't dawdle. You don't walk and take a selfie of yourself. <laughs> because you will get enough, alright? There must be a sign here, yeah, no selfies on <laughs> But if you happen to do like this guy, you get the right idea. You just walk like this. I promise you that each one of you will not get dropped. Also, you see a lot of water on the side. That's important. 
not only for afterwards, but before they actually even go in here, they get very, very damp. So they get their feet very much moist. So when they even jump in, it's even less. <coughs> so on the RV side, for the new members, we're going to do a special <laughs> membership. <laughs> <laughs> so after the service, <laughs> yeah, and I'm not going to show you how to do it. <laughs> we're going to have a fire walking session. Are you with me, guys? Lord, I know you want to do this. I love to do it. You love to do it. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> fire walking. Would you believe that in the Bible, we were original fire walkers? There's a story in the Bible in Daniel about three men that were thrown into a fire and they, come, they came out unharmed. Let's read that together. If you have your Bibles with you, let us turn to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3 to read about the original first fire walkers. Thank you, Tony. <coughs> Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Can you tell me the background to the story is that at the time after Solomon's death, King Solomon, the empire broke into two, northern part of Israel, southern part of Judah. And because of internal politics and fighting between the two nations, the other nations around, the powers that be, Assyria and Babylon, took this as an opportunity to conquer Israel. And this is what they've done. In about 700 BC, the Assyrian empire conquered the northern part of Israel. And took away all the ten tribes to none of Syria, none of the basic capital of the Syrian Empire. Then about 600 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, he was into the southern part of Judah, and he conquered Jerusalem, and took all the Jews into exile into Babylon. <coughs> if you want to know where Babylon is in today, it's right there, center in the middle of Iraq. Did you know that? Many times in the Bible, the Garden of Eden was in Iraq, around this area. Babylon is very, very important in the Bible. There's two cities named in the Bible more times than any other city ever. The first one is Jerusalem. The second one is Babylon. From Genesis to Revelation, Babylon features. And it's very important that it's in the middle of Iraq. We won't get into that now, but it deals with the Antichrist and prophecy, but very, very important later to do with Revelation. So there they were in Babylon. It's even there today. If you go visit Baghdad on the outskirts of Baghdad today in Iraq, you can actually visit Babylon. They've really excavated it. They've really rebuilt it. Even the time of Saddam Hussein, they actually had coins made with King Nebuchadnezzar's head on and Saddam Hussein's head, just to commemorate the day of the dedication of the new Babylon. So there they were. The Jews were in Babylon in exile. And this one day Nebuchadnezzar has a great crazy idea. He wants to build for himself a statue, a huge statue, 90 feet tall, made of gold, 9 feet wide. And he's going to have a special day when he's going to dedicate this. So he invites all the VIPs, all the very important people, the governors, members of parliament, everyone except Palema and the EFF. <laughs> they will never be invited with anything in the middle as well because they're a bunch of monkeys. Right? He only wants top class people there. Right? And if you want to get a size of how big it can be, this is the statue of Liberty, yes, in New York City. Lady Liberty from head to toe is about 111 feet. Can you never the statue was? 90 feet. A little bit short than that. But you can get a good idea of how big it was. This is also on a big pedestal. And you get an idea of how small the people, you can see them around. So this would be a good idea, modern day time, if you were there at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. So this is how the statue would probably look. This is an artist's depiction of it. So you see the statue, you see all the people gathered. It's a great day of dedication. All the people are gathered, they're all waiting to see what will happen. And the herald comes forward. This is like the spokesperson for Nebuchadnezzar. He comes forward and he says, All you people, hear ye, hear ye. This is a great day for Nebuchadnezzar. When you hear the music, the lion, the harp, and the drums, and the guitars, when you hear the sound of the music, all of you must bow down and worship the image. That's the good part. The next part he says, And if you don't, by the way, you will get thrown into a fiery furnace. So Michael, what would you do, honestly? Hey, what would your choice be? <laughs> For us sitting here and you'd make the day, you're probably thinking, well, obviously I won't die down. But if you were back then in those days, 
You sit and listen to that. Worship the image or burn in a fiery furnace. It's a no-brainer, all right? They're going to worship the image. Nobody wants to burn. So you can imagine what happens. All them on the shop. They're waiting for the music. Silence! Only the fans are going. Silence! And then the music starts to play. Remember, oh, you're going to hear it again now. And then the music plays. Oh. What happens? Everybody falls to the ground. What, 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 what? All them from knees, hands, some prostrate. They all worship in the image. Why? Because they don't want to get thrown into a fiery furnace. So they're all on the floor. All of a sudden, the dust is getting all around. The dust starts to settle. And there's secret police of Nebuchadnezzar. They're astrologers. They go around the crowd looking for people who have not fallen down and worship. And there they find three men. Three Hebrew boys. Stand and defiant. Hands cross saying, we will not worship this image. So they run back to Nebuchadnezzar. They say, King, there's three men that do not want to worship the image. He says, call them here. So they call these three boys up. And Nebuchadnezzar knows them because they really have high appointments in the parliament already. They're very they're government officials as it is. And their names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now I know some of you think I'm speaking Greek. We're going to say that together, just so you get it. First one is Meshach. Say that. Meshach. Second one, Shadrach. Shadrach. Third one, Abednego. Abednego. I'm saying that because I struggled for like 20 years to say those three names. I did not know too how to pronounce it, so I'm teaching you how to do it. So when you read it, it will come out easier. And you know that these three names are Babylonian names. They're not the original birth names. They were Jews. Their names were Hanaliah, Azariah, and they had beautiful names. And then when they came to Babylon, what he done was he changed their name. And you know what was bad about it? He gave them new names, names that honor the false gods. Shadrach and Meshach, honor the god Anu, Babylonian god. And Benigo is a name that honors the god Nigo or Nebo. So you can imagine how they feel. They're Jews worshiping Jehovah, and now they've got names. They say that they worship other gods. But here they stood defiant. They did not want to worship the image. So Nebuchadnezzar calls him forward and says, Guys, I like you guys. I know you. I'm going to give you one more chance. So when the music plays again, I want you to worship the image. What do you think they did? Did they worship? No. They were good guys. So what happens? He says, I'm going to put the music on. And the boys step forward and they say, King, we don't want to fight with you. We've got no reason to defend ourselves. But we will not worship the image. And even if you throw us into the fire, you know what? The God we serve, He will save us from the fire. But they don't stop there. They say something else. And even if, he, if you throw us into the fire, we will still not worship the image. Man, now that's faith. You know, a lot of Christians today have a faulty faith. We got the faith that says, God, if you heal me, I will worship you. you anybody know that? God, if you get me a better job, I will come to church and I'll do a good job. Anybody familiar with this kind of faith? Maybe you've done it yourself a couple of times. It's a bargaining faith. Where we come before God and say, God, if you do this, I will do this. And you know what happens? Let's say somebody doesn't get healed or you don't get the promotion. And what do you do? You turn back to God. But God, we had a deal. We had a contract. If I do this, you do that. And then what happened? Because God didn't come through for them, they turned their back on God. I've seen it so many times. Because of a tragedy, a trial, a tribulation, a sickness, even a death, a loss of a loved one. People have bargained with God and thought that He was just this heavenly puppet that they used to pull strings with. He's not that God. He's the creator of the universe. It's time that Christians start respecting and fearing the God that we serve. He's not just a puppet. God, you just all do this. These three boys had the right idea. They said, throw us in because the God we serve, He will save us. But you know what? Even if you throw us in, we still won't die. You know what? Because we love God. And we will worship Him and we will praise Him no matter what the circumstances. 
So often Christians get caught up in the circumstances of life. And we let the life and, and circumstances and challenges dictate how we worship God. That's not how we worship God. Our love and respect and our worship and praise of God has nothing to do with your circumstances. We do it because we love Him. Who loves Jesus? A couple of them. Good. Why do you worship Him? Because you love Him. It doesn't matter if you're sick, if you're on a deathbed or you're in a mountain of some praise. You love Him, you worship Him because He is Jesus. This is what these men understood. So you can imagine what Nebuchadnezzar felt. They said, no, we will not do it. What did he do? He was furious. He said, that's it. I'm going to chuck you into the fire. And he told his men to put the fire seven times hotter. I don't know how they knew it was seven times hotter. It's not like a microwave. Yeah? It's not like an LED display. Hey, you want Didn't I say one, two, the guy was waiting. The seven, king is good to go. I have no idea. But it was seven times hotter. So they started blowing the, the flames and it's got hot, hot, hot. And then they bound the three guys and they threw them into the furnace. It was so hot that the men who threw them in actually died. Now that's a fire. I have some rice at home, you know, an Englishman braai. Don't like the Afrikaans people because they, whoo, this whole house will be burning down for an Afrikaans fire. Uh, I'll tell you how an Englishman does a fire. It's a couple of pieces of wood, a little bit. <laughs> this was an Afrikaans fire, or right, from dispatch, no. all right? Aubrey, a little Aubrey fire. But it's huge, and he throws them in. Good riddance to them. They don't want to worship, so they're going to die. And now the king is busy he's just watching them burn. And then he sees something. And, and, he, and he looks, and he doesn't know what it is. And he, he looks inside the furnace, he tries to get closer, and he looks again, and then he calls his soldiers, and he's... Uh, the, Bottom guys and the governors, and he says, Listen, guys, how many people did we throw in here? They said, Three, three. He says, And why is it that I see four people in the fire? Four people. Who's the other person? He gets so shocked, he calls him out. He says, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, go, come out. You know what happens? They come out. They come walking out. Not on fire, not smelling of smoke, not burn, not even their hair was singed. They come walking out towards him and he got such a shock. The only thing that burned was the ropes that bound him. So they come out untouched, unscathed, talking about the original fire walkers. That guys that the Indians do, that's nothing compared to what these guys have gone through. They come out untouched. King Nebuchadnezzar is shocked. He says to all the people, from now on, nobody talks bad about their main God. The God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he is to be praised. He actually goes further and says, if anybody talks bad about you, you're going to be killed. So that's another threat on their life. Who was this fourth person? Muhammad. Was it Buddha? Was it Malema? No, it wasn't Malema. <coughs> the Bible that we read, it says, the son of the gods, the King James Version, actually says the fourth person was like the son of God. Can't get more clearer than that, than the son of God is. All Christian commentators put it down that the fourth person in the fiery furnace was none other than Jesus himself. And I love that. Here's a math question for you. How many men were put into the furnace? Three. How many men were in the furnace? Four. How many men came out of the fire? Three. Where was the fourth person? Where was Jesus? He was still in the fire. You notice that? And you know why he was still? Because each one of us had to go through a fire. And when we do, Jesus will be. That's what the message is. He stayed there. Why? Because all of us are going to go through trials in our life. Fiery trials. And when we go through these trials, Jesus is there waiting for us. The promise in Isaiah says this, Isaiah 43, when you walk through the fire, notice, not God will deliver us from the fire. It doesn't say if, it says when. Who has been through a fire in the last week, the last month, the last year? Can I put up your hands? We all go through fires, trials of fires, tribulations and trials and challenges that really push us to our limits. We feel like we're in a fire. We feel like we're being burned. We feel like we're consumed. And God says this, when you walk through the fire, 
You will not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Isn't that a beautiful promise? When you go through these fiery trials, you are not alone. The fourth person is with you. Jesus is with you. And although you are going through the fire, He will bring you out of the fire and He will bring you out untouched. He might not deliver you from the fire, but He will keep the fire from you. Did you get it? He might not deliver you from the fire, but He will make sure that the fire does not harm you. That is what this says. In our trials, tribulations, and God knows we go through a lot of them. Just like He's fiery, uh, the team in the fiery furnace, you and I might be going through one today, a spiritual trial, where our faith is challenged, just like these men. Maybe we go through sickness, medical issues. Maybe you know someone in hospital right now that's fighting for their life. Maybe we have financial burdens. Everyone's got financial burdens, especially the minister. Just so you know. All right? <laughs> you know, we all go through trouble with relationship issues. There's no one in this church today that has not gone through a problem, in a problem, or let me give you the worst news, he's going to go through a problem soon. It's a way of life. Jesus said himself, in this life, you will have trouble. It's kind of like a... He, uh, he told us, it's not like, a, oh, if, or maybe. It's, he, he said, no, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer, because I've overcome the world. Jesus is there with you. In the fire, when you look around, who are you going to see? You're going to see the beautiful face of Jesus. And when you have the faith, they say, Jesus, even though I'm in this trial, even though I'm in this fire, I don't want to be here. It's uncomfortable. I want to get out. Be comforted that you will not get burned. When you place your faith in Him, and you love and worship Him the way you should, you will come out of that fire better off than you were before. You know what happened to these guys? They came out and were promoted. Do you know that? They should have been whipped and they crucified and they sent back, but they weren't. They came out and because of that faith, they were promoted to higher positions in the court of Babylon. I'll tell you one more story about um, these couple of girls, ladies, who were doing a Bible study. Some of you might be familiar with the story, but somehow, what's that group? recently. A group of ladies were in a Bible study group and they read from Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 says, He will sit as a refiner and purify our silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them by gold and silver. When the Lord will have men, will bring offerings in righteousness. So first part, very really confused as ladies. They couldn't understand how God sat as a refiner and a purifier of silver. So the one lady decided, she's going to go find out. So she got a hold of a silversmith. And said, listen, can I have an appointment with you? I want to come and see what you do. So she went there and she watched what he was doing. He took a piece of steel, a piece of metal, and he was holding it over the fire. For a while, he was holding it there while it burned. It was getting red hot. And then she said to him, do you have to sit there? Why can't you just leave and walk away? He said, no, I have to sit there and watch it all the time. If I leave it too long, it will get burned and destroyed. And she thought, wow, that's a beautiful side of God that he hasn't seen before. While we're in the fire, we may be burning. But God has His eye on you. He has His hand on you. And He will not push you too far. He will pull you out just at the right time. He said, you know why He does it so long? To burn away the impurities. That's also nice. Because some of us have things that are holding us back from God. Certain habits or sins. Things that are holding us back from being all we can with God. The reason for holding it there that long is to burn away those impurities. And then He said one final question. Tell me, how do you know when it's been purified, how do you know when the soul is now purified and finished and complete? He smiled and said, oh, that's easy. And then I see my reflection in the soul. Do you see the beauty in that? You and I will go through trials. And God will allow us to go through trials. He will be with us and He will be watching us every second of the way. <coughs> He'll never turn His back on us. He'll never abandon us or fail us. And when we come out, people will see the reflection of God in you. Because you'll be promoted to another level of your spiritual destiny. People will see God in you like never before. Who wants to see God in them? That is the role of a Christian. To be Christ-like, is it not? People should look at us and they should not see Raven. They should not see Arlene or Aubrey. They should see Jesus. When we get to a place in our life where people don't recognize you no more, God bless you because you're in the right place. Because people are beginning to see the reflection of God in you. Today, as you apply this message to your life, as the trials you go through, these fiery furnaces, know that you are not alone. 
Jesus is with you. He will not fail you or abandon you. He's got his eye on you. And when you come out, there's two things I need you to understand. When you go in, because that's a definite. But I need you to understand too, when you come out. You're not going to be left there alone to burn. You're going to come out. So you're going to go in, but you're going to have the faith that you're going to come out. And when you come out, you're going to be better off than you were before. Increased, promoted. You're going to rise to a new level of your faith. A new level of your destiny. And I believe and declare that you will become everything that God created you to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.